from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. I am uh, delighted to introduce uh, our next speaker, who is uh, one of the uh, not only most influential scholars to write uh, on James Madison, but also one of those who is most uh, uh, delightful to read. Drew McCoy uh, is the Jacob and Francis Hyatt Professor of History at Clark University in Worcester, Massachusetts. And before that, he taught at Harvard University and the University of Texas at Austin. Most of us will know him from his two magnificent uh, books on Madison and uh, things Madisonian. Uh, the first was a book really about political economy in the founding period, a book called The Elusive Republic, Political Economy in Jeffersonian America, which has had a tremendous influence, I would say, slow but steady over the years on the scholarship of the period. Uh, it engages many of the questions that um, Lance Banning was discussing this morning about the character of Madison's relationship to commercial society and his attitude towards commercial society, as well as larger questions of, uh, of political economy in the founding and right after the founding period. Uh, it has really, uh, it, it's, it's a, still a very interesting book uh, to read and a very basic and important text for anyone writing on the issues of this period. His more recent book is also, in a way, a, quite a gem. Um, the, the Last of the Fathers, James Madison and the Republican Legacy, uh, was published in 1989 and uh, was awarded the John Dunning Prize by the American Historical Association, as well as the New England Historical Association Book Award. Its paperback edition was published more recently in 1991. This is a wonderful a tour of the life and the thought of the later James Madison, who had the privilege, I suppose, but also the burden of outliving virtually everyone else uh, in the founding generation, living long enough to see the Calhounian uh, challenge and the states' rights challenge, the nullification and secession problems in, in embryo, at least, um, in Jacksonian America, and to, of course, respond to them but also a man who had the leisure of retirement and old age in which to reflect on his own achievements and the achievements of his generation. As a piece of historical portraiture and analysis, I really don't know anything that uh, uh, quite compares with it. Drew McCoy is currently writing a book, working on a book on Abraham Lincoln, a popular destination apparently after James Madison or even before James Madison with this crowd. And I, it is a great personal pleasure for me to introduce him to you today, Drew McCoy. Thank you, Charles. And you'll have to forgive me for mentioning very quickly in passing toward the beginning of my talk, Edmund Burke. I didn't realize that in doing so, I would uh, contribute to controversy here at the symposium. I'd like to use as my point of departure this afternoon uh, Madison's well-known respect for generational connection and continuity. As I've suggested in my book, The Last of the Fathers, Madison had an almost Burkean understanding of the relationship among generations that sharply distinguishes him from his friend Jefferson. Unlike Jefferson, Madison declined to talk grandly or blithely about the sovereignty of the living generation nor did he embrace his friend's corollary principle that constitutions, as well as laws, naturally expire and lose their legitimacy at the end of every 19 years. Viewed in this light, Madison's republicanism was informed by a philosophical conservatism largely, if not utterly, absent in Jefferson's thought. Madison's conservative respect for generational obligation in turn prompts us to ponder our connection to him. If we ask the broad question, how might we profitably remember James Madison today on the occasion of his 250th birthday, we can seek answers in a number of different ways. But I firmly believe that we may miss something important if we take too abstract an approach to Madison's ideas. Indeed, the point I wish to develop this afternoon can be simply stated here at the outset. I believe a richer, 
more meaningful understanding of Madison and his legacy becomes possible if we approach his ideas from the perspective of his character and experience. So please bear with me as I follow that theme down a number of paths uh, with a digression, autobiographical and anecdotal, thrown in. Probably the best answer to the question, what is still living in James Madison today, is regrettably not much, at least outside academia. Among scholars, of course, Madison remains very much alive. Well known, now thoroughly studied, and more than ever, I think, respected. As you all know, the scholars Madison is the principal architect of the United States Constitution, whose writings about government rank among the pro most profound expressions of political thought in American history. But outside the rarefied circles of professional scholarship, in which analysis of his ideas has become a cottage industry of sorts, Madison, it seems to me, remains obscure, if not invisible. Indeed, the bicentennial efforts of the late 1980s notwithstanding, among present-day Americans, Madison may actually enjoy less name recognition, name recognition than his vivacious and much younger wife, Dolly, now enshrined in popular culture as the first First Lady. Why? Well, Madison was diminutive in physical stature. He was modest, even self-effacing in his public demeanor. And by all accounts, he was generally shy to the point of being withdrawn, at least in public. As such, Madison remains today, as he did to a considerable extent in his own time, largely in the shadow of his close friend and political ally, Jefferson, a much more colorful, more versatile, and certainly more commanding presence. Now, modern scholars understand what at least some of the two men's contemporaries did, that Madison was actually the more disciplined, more incisive, and hence more profound thinker of the two great Jeffersonians. But certainly in the popular imagination, where the subtlety or precision of Madison's ideas tends to count for little, and Jefferson's rhetorical talent and his unbounded faith in the people mean everything, Madison seems destined always to play second fiddle to the master of Monticello, which is my cue for that digression I warned you about. In my opinion, there may be no better, more revealing measure of Madison's obscurity than the present condition of his cherished home, Montpelier, an almost 3,000-acre estate in Orange County, Virginia, that includes, of course, the mansion house that Madison himself twice expanded and remodeled from the modest two-story dwelling that his father had first constructed in the 18th century, the mid-18th century. Now, as many of you know, Montpelier passed out of the Madison family quite early, in 1842, only six years after James's death. And over a half century later, in 1902, the estate was purchased by William DuPont, a titan of the American chemical industry. Mr. DuPont made major structural changes to the interior of Madison's house, adding more than 20 new rooms, while his wife turned her attention to the exterior and grounds, most notably by replacing Madison's gardens with fresh designs of her own. In 1936, the estate passed to the DuPont's daughter, Marion DuPont Scott. And almost another half century later, in the early 1980s, Mrs. Scott's relatives were shocked to learn upon her death that she had bequeathed Montpelier not to them, but to the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Most important, Mrs. Scott enjoined the trust to preserve the estate as a memorial to James Madison and his times. For over 15 years now, the trust has struggled to make sense of that charge. Very little of Madison's Montpelier, at least in terms of the house and immediate grounds, had survived the DuPont's remaking, and little more seemed recoverable. Or to put it in more meaningful terms, Montpelier was never going to be Monticello. And the earliest preservation planning at Montpelier proceeded appropriately under the rubric of the search for James Madison. Now, when you have to search for someone in his own home, you have a serious problem. <laughs> and I quickly became aware of the full magnitude of the trust challenge during my first visit to Montpelier in 1986. At that time, the trust had barely begun its preservation efforts, 
and the house itself could not be open to visitors. But from the best of intentions, the trust had decided to throw open at least part of the estate to the public, and visitors were invited to take a guided tour of the exterior of the house and its immediate surroundings. And I did. Unfortunately, my initial excitement as a visitor to James Madison's home soon turned to unease, then to frustration, and finally to despair. My tour guides were two local high school students who patiently shepherded me around. Wherever James Madison was at Montpelier that day, he was hiding. In fact, his name was barely mentioned. The tour, as it turned out, focused on the DuPonts, especially Marion DuPont Scott. And whenever the Madison phase of Montpelier's history did come up, more often than not, the references were to Dolly, not James Madison. Finally, at the conclusion of my tour, not wishing to vent my frustration on two well-meaning teenagers, I tried to save the day for myself and get some reassurance by asking them a question, the answer to which I should have seen coming but didn't. Where exactly are you guys from, I asked, whereupon they informed me they had grown up in Barbersville, not far away. So what's it like to grow up in Orange County, I asked them. Is James Madison still a presence here? I mean, were you aware of him as you were growing up as a kind of local hero? Well, these two kids looked at me as if I were from outer space. <laughs> Clearly, they had never heard such a question, and I'm not sure they understood what I meant. Well, no, not really, one answered. And then, after a few awkward moments of silence, his face suddenly brightened, and I think, thinking that he, he, that I would be reassured, he blurted out, but we always knew who Mrs. Scott was. <laughs> and so it goes. Needless to say, the trust has come a long way since 1986 in meeting the challenge of finding James Madison at Montpelier. A recent vision or mission statement of the Long Range Planning Committee, dating from the mid-1990s, reads as follows. Quote, to honor James Madison, fourth President of the United States, and architect of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, and to perpetuate his ideals and principles. On one level, it's tough to argue with that approach and with its many admirable consequences, including the exciting educational programs now in place at Montpelier. Still, I wonder if we may be overlooking the full potential of Montpelier as an historic site. By focusing our attention and energy on the scholarly image of Madison, by which I mean Madison as thinker of great thoughts and founder of great principles, we may forget to dramatize at Montpelier something else worth remembering, what I'm referring to this afternoon as the intersection of his character, vision, and experience. Or to put the point differently, enough of Madison and the Madison era may still be alive at Montpelier to remind us that there was even more to this man and his legacy than his ideas, abstractly considered, and his authorship of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. What do I mean? Well, first of all, when, when we remember Madison, I think we probably need to think in terms of failure as well as success, which means taking into full account slavery and, above all, the Civil War. It should be hard to forget that Madison, as founding father, is vitally linked to the great American Civil War. But all too often, we manage to do just that. Many visitors today encounter on their way to Montpelier the battlefields from 1862, 63, and above all, 1864. Because the road to Orange from Fredericksburg, itself the site of terrible carnage, passes directly through Chancellorsville and the wilderness. I think visitors need to be reminded that the proximity of those historical sites to Montpelier is neither coincidental nor incidental. Nor is the fact that soldiers from Robert E. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia camped on the grounds of Montpelier in the summer, late summer of 1863, after Gettysburg, and when they had a celebration, almost literally danced on Madison's grave. Put simply, Montpelier should remind us of Madison's connection to the war and in a larger sense of the many revealing and ultimately tragic ways in which the circumstances of his own life 
intersected all of those larger public issues that preoccupied him throughout his long public career. Who was the James Madison whom we still might find at Montpelier if we search hard enough? Well, I hope you'll bear with me as I develop my theme through a brief interpretive sketch of the full sweep of Madison's life and career. It seems to me that James Madison, Jr. is best introduced as the firstborn son of the wealthiest planter in Orange County, Virginia, a prosperous provincial outpost of the British Empire in the mid-18th century, noted for its tobacco-growing economy based on slave labor. His father had the means and good sense to seek for his intellectually gifted son the best education available in such a raw, isolated environment. After five years at a local private school and two more years of tutoring at home, the young Madison journeyed in the late 1760s to the College of New Jersey, where he studied under the demanding and inspiring direction of President John Witherspoon, a Scottish clergyman who introduced his American students to what we now call the Scottish Enlightenment. Madison pondered the writings of David Hume, Adam Ferguson, and Adam Smith, among others, immersing himself in the moral philosophy of a group of creative thinkers who were seeking to establish a science of human nature and social development. After returning home to Montpelier in the early 1770s from Princeton, the rich intellectual ambience of which he sorely missed, Madison suffered through several years of unhappy isolation and indecision regarding his future. Then abruptly came the American Revolution, an event that defined to a remarkable extent not just Madison's subsequent career in politics, but his mature sense of his life's purpose. For the next 60 years, often amid considerable emotional urgency, he avidly pursued the Republican dream that gave meaning to his life. The 20th century poet Robert Frost once mused that the best dreamer of the American dream may not have been some wild-eyed enthusiast like Jefferson, but rather the meticulous, soft-spoken Madison, whose dream, Frost perceptively inferred, was, quote, of a new land to fulfill with people in self-control. People like Madison himself, he might have added. In temperament and in, and in character, the mature Madison who emerged from the revolution became a model of neoclassical self-command. In time, his admirers came to understand and appreciate the extent to which his characteristic modesty, temperance, and perseverance represented a triumph of reason over passion in a man whose concern for the public good generally did override any petty considerations of personal vanity or partisan advantage. Believing that unrestrained passion threatened moral order within individuals as well as in society, Madison placed the appropriate premium on balance and restraint, not only in his own character and behavior, but in the American Republic that would ideally reflect those same values. In doing so, he caught the animating spirit of the enlightened neoclassical world of the American Revolution, which in turn raised the question and the challenge that became the focus of this provincial Virginian's life. Could people as they actually were in modern commercial society, and not as visionaries imagined or wished them to be, govern themselves. Here I think Madison is best described as a conservative optimist and a prudent idealist. He believed that republicanism could be made to work in America, certainly a radical idea in an age when monarchical or at least aristocratic authority was still widely assumed to be the necessary basis for social order but only if prudent statesmen took into sufficient account the dangers posed by human nature and also acknowledged the importance of custom and tradition in stabilizing a Republican regime. Above all, as Madison wrestled with the problems that arose during the years just after the War for American Independence, he came to understand that republicanism and nationality in America were inextricably linked. As Madison saw it, Passionate, self-interested men and the factions they would inevitably form endangered the necessary measure of civilized stability, even in America, where a revolutionary people had turned out to be not so virtuous as Madison and others had originally hoped. But Madison, drawing, at least to some extent, on the insights of Hume, 
hoped that by extending the sphere of Republican government from the state level, where in practice it didn't seem to be working terribly well, to the federal or national level, the new Constitution of 1787 might offer a novel remedy for the diseases most incident to popular government. And to some meaningful extent, I suppose, the subsequent history of the early American Republic amply fulfilled Madison's cautious optimism. The Constitution survived several major crises, most notably in the late 1790s, and then again during the War of 1812. And in both instances, Madison was instrumental in securing the Republic. First, by organizing and leading opposition to a political faction whose vision and policies lacked broad-based popular support, and then by leading the country as president through an extraordinarily trying second war for independence against England. Indeed, when Madison retired from public life in 1817, following his second term as president, both he and the Republic seemed triumphant after decades of divisive domestic and international turmoil. In truth, however, and certainly as Madison came to understand in retrospect, not all was well with the Republican experiment. If the survival of the United States during the War of 1812 represented a political triumph for the Jeffersonians, one that momentarily obscured some deeper sources of trouble, Madison had the misfortune to survive long enough to have to confront the ambiguities and the shortcomings of his and his generation's legacy. During the almost two decades of his retirement, from 1817 to 1836, while his beloved republic entered a new, explosive phase of its history, Madison always remained characteristically even-tempered and optimistic about the future he would not live to see. But his stoical equanimity was severely tested. He fretted openly, for instance, as new approaches to constitutional interpretation threatened the stability of a regime that he believed must remain anchored to the precedent and tradition established during its founding. Indeed, if Madison's character and vision had been formed in an 18th century neoclassical world in which reason was enjoined to discipline the unsettling effects of passion, one might say that he spent his final years having to accommodate to a more modern Jacksonian world of romantic democracy in which passionate individualism threatened, as he saw it, to overturn all restraints of custom, tradition, and history. He especially feared for the stability of a union precariously founded in a tradition of regional compromise that passionate factions now failed to understand or respect. And above all, events in his own life at Montpelier, as well as in the public arena, would not let him forget that the American Republic, which he passionately wished to have offer the world the full benefit of its moral and political example, was in fact a regime that included in more than an incidental or ephemeral way, the abominable retrograde institution of chattel slavery. In this area, more than any other, perhaps, Madison's personal experience dramatically intersected and illuminated his larger public concerns. If nothing else, Montpelier can remind us that James Madison was intimately involved with slavery for all of his 85 years. As the eldest son of a well-to-do planner, we might say he literally inherited the dilemma. He had grown up in an environment substantially shaped by the presence of slaves, and he still owned close to 100 at the time of his death in 1836. Of course, we rightly honor Madison as a principled opponent of slavery for all of his adult life, which is to say we can never forget that he categorically condemned the institution as intrinsically unjust, indeed as a contradiction of the fundamental principles of a Republican revolution rooted in the logic of natural right. That belief in turn generated Madison's commitment to abolishing slavery in the United States. For him, in other words, the question was never if, but only when and how. But the when and how of abolishing slavery became the rub because Madison also understood its deep roots in a society in which racial differences had powerful psychological and cultural resonance. 
Above all, Madison believed that a general emancipation of the slaves in the United States would be practical only under certain circumstances made necessary by the slaves' race. Even as the explosive development of the southwestern cotton frontier in the early 19th century might have suggested otherwise, he stubbornly insisted that the only major impediment to emancipation was this larger, looming dilemma of racial adjustment, rather than the continuing profitability of the institution. Now, unlike his friend Thomas Jefferson, Madison never expressed his own suspicion that blacks were intrinsically inferior to whites. Nor did he, to the best of my knowledge, ever express alarm about the danger of racial amalgamation. But he did clearly accept as permanent the prejudice against blacks held by virtually all of his countrymen, a prejudice that he assumed would make impossible the integration of free blacks as equal citizens in a biracial republic. If principle demanded an end to slavery, prudence dictated that slavery be abolished only when the former slaves, always Madison insisted with their consent, could be colonized outside the United States. We know that he failed to persuade any of his slaves at Montpelier to follow his message and his lead and become founding fathers in the West African colony of Liberia. But Madison never stopped believing that colonization offered African Americans their best, perhaps their only chance, of escaping slavery. He saw little reason to doubt that his fellow white Americans would never voluntarily accept emancipation on a large scale if freeing the slaves meant having to find a place for what would now be millions of African Americans within the United States. Toward the very end of his life in the 1830s, Madison's predicament only worsened. Along with a major slave rebellion in his native state, he encountered two new forms of extremism. A shrill, uncompromising demand for immediate abolition without colonization, and in his own region, early hints of a principled defense of slavery. As in John Calhoun's words from the year after Madison's death, a positive good. Under these circumstances, Madison saw little choice, it seems to me, but to cling to and even promote his faith in colonization, especially as he listened to the pro-slavery voices of a younger generation of Virginians. He saw clearly what the most likely alternative to keeping faith in colonization as the necessary adjunct to emancipation would be. He referred to that likely alternative in 1833 as, quote, a torpid acquiescence in perpetual slavery, in the permanence of slavery, an acquiescence that would insidiously threaten to undermine the Republic's fundamental principles. I suspect Madison knew that Americans who gave up on colonization and accepted the permanence of slavery might be lulled into accepting either the absurd proposition that the slaves were not fully human or the equally repugnant proposition that Republican principles had never been meant to apply to all human beings after all. To that extent, colonization became Madison's only hope of sustaining any hope of voluntary emancipation in the United States, and even perhaps of sustaining principled opposition to slavery itself. Well, from our vantage point, it's almost too easy to be disappointed, if not disillusioned, by Madison's faith in colonization. We know it struck at least one admirer in his own time, a young English writer named Harriet Martineau, as incongruously naive and myopic, as indeed, I suppose it does, virtually all admirers of Madison today. Martineau visited her hero at Montpelier in the winter of 1835, the year before his death. And for three days, they talked about virtually everything under the sun, past, going back to Roman times, present, and even future. The irrepressible old man proved to be everything Martineau had ever wanted in a hero. Still, she found it difficult to fathom his unshakable commitment to colonization. In the end, 
she could explain her hero's short-sightedness only as an ironic reflection of his larger, unyielding faith in the American experiment in self-government, or what she referred to as Madison's faith that a well-founded commonwealth might be immortal, not only because the people, its constituency, never die, but because the principles of justice in which, in which such a commonwealth originates never die out of the people's heart and mind. In one sense, as Martineau appears to have shrewdly inferred, Madison never lost faith in his countrymen's faith in the first principles of their republic, principles that condemned slavery as unjust and hence led to their refusal ever to succumb to his torpid acquiescence in its permanence. But that same faith may also have prevented Madison from admitting to others, and perhaps even to himself, that his republic was in fact fatally flawed, in practice, if not in principle, and likely headed for disaster. What may be most remarkable in retrospect is that Madison's republic somehow managed to outlive him by several decades until a quarter century after his death, the Holocaust of civil war that he had come to dread brought a dramatic, decisive end to the union in which he had invested so much of himself. That war also initiated a long overdue, and as it turned out, a prolonged national reckoning with the unavoidably tragic underside of Madison and his generation's noble legacy that is, with the consequences of slavery and race. For all of his brilliance, for all of his intellectual courage and honesty, and above all, for all of his faith in his countrymen, that is, for all the things that make Madison truly a hero, he was in one sense fighting a battle against slavery that he simply could not win. As the Civil War demonstrated, his beloved republic could survive, and its principles were upheld only through the massive application of force, not through reasoned voluntary consent. And from the vantage point of 1865, the price tag on Madison's union became those unspeakably bloody battlefields along the road to his old home at Montpelier. Thank you. Sure, if I can see through the light. Yes, ma'am. to free the slaves. Instead, he profited from the slavery. And if you go to Montpelier today, there's a slave cemetery that's there. I think you're right. I think that is the, as they say, the bottom line. If we assume that everyone has choice, and I think he did, ultimately he did choose to remain in Virginia, to accept his legacy from his father, land and slaves, and to play it out on that basis. That point's particularly interesting because we do have at least some evidence uh, from the 1780s that Madison gave, um, well, it's hard to tell how serious it was, gave thought, perhaps serious thought, to, in effect, expatriating himself, that is, leaving Virginia as a way of escaping the part of Virginia society, including slavery, that he found uncomfortable. He began speculating, or buying land in upstate New York. Um, at least made some vague statements to others that he was considering leaving. Shortly after that, his father passed on to him early, prematurely, uh, some of his, um, his inheritance, which included some slaves. Uh, whatever, uh, Madison, didn't leave, he stayed, he became the master of Montpelier, and you're absolutely correct. He and his family did profit from the labor of the folks that he, he owned, no question. Um, I think what became 
for Madison, I, I would hesitate myself to use the word hypocrite, but I could understand why, uh, why others might. I, I think the predicament for Madison was to some extent, in the sense that he made the choice we've been talking about, of his own making. Because once he made that decision to stay, to keep his roots in Virginia, then he began the struggle of reconciling his deepest beliefs about slavery and about the republic with his own personal experience and with the larger condition of the republic. By all accounts, Madison was probably as benevolent and kind a master as we can imagine. He also had a very um, accurate and vivid understanding of the fact that some of the folks that he owned had deeper roots at Montpelier than he did and were very much tied to, for better or for worse, Montpelier, which carried with it a sense of obligation. To cut to the chase, I think what the situation Madison confronted in his own life by the 18 teens, 20s, and 30s was complicated certainly by the Virginia law of 1806, which prohibited someone from freeing slaves unless they could guarantee they would leave the Commonwealth within a year, and the larger uh, racial conditions in the United States. What were the options? Well, he could manumit his slaves and help provide for their exit from the state. Um, If he did that, the best destination for them, he thought, all things considered, was Liberia. And Madison was the president. It was largely a titular um, situation of the American Colonization Society. And we have third hand and scattered evidence that he tried to persuade some of his slaves to take that route, that is, be manumitted and go become founding fathers in Liberia. And the evidence is that, not surprisingly, he was able to persuade none of them to, uh, to take that, that path. Um, he could manumit them, and I think he was financially able to do it for much of his retirement, and somehow try to help them get to a free state. What he said time and again was that he knew the conditions free blacks faced in other parts of the United States, and he wasn't convinced that that was an attractive future for, um, for these Montpelier folks as well. It's a sad commentary, I think, both on the condition of his society and going back to the original point you made, perhaps decisions Madison, in terms of his own life, had made earlier, that what ended up being uh, his sense of the best he could do for his slaves was to leave them under the benevolent control of his wife in his will, which he did. He did not free any of his slaves in his will. Um, yes, I think you're right. I think you can make the statement you said, and I think that is, in some ways, the bottom line. I myself, perhaps because I'm too, too fond of Madison, would, would hesitate to use the, use the word hypocrisy. But in, one level, if, if hypocrisy means acting in ways that, that uh, contradict what you say you believe in, I wouldn't argue with you. Yeah. I think our generation faces, our generation faces a similar quandary um, to the, the slaves in the, the 17th centuries. That is, our use of the automobile and other pollution uh, and carbon dioxide burning fuels and uh, we know it's in the best interest of the world to cut down or not use them, and yet we use them. And I'm wondering what, what uh, price tag we're going to have to pay in the future. I see the, I see the analogy you're making, yeah. We're waiting for the microphone. I didn't mean to speak again, but I have to tell you about what happened to two of Madison's slaves. 
This is 12 years after his death in 1848. And Dolly Madison is in the process of persuading Congress to buy Madison's papers. Right, yeah. She's also in the process of selling off his slaves, or they're her slaves by now, to pay the debts, I think, of her good-for-nothing son. Yes. <laughs> One of the, there were a mother and daughter, and the daughter's name was Ellen, Ellen Ann, she's sometimes known as. And Ellen Ann realized when a slave trader came to the house that she was to be next on the block. And so she ran away. And she was eventually captured and brought back. And Mrs. Madison sold her to a tra slave trader. Um, and she was taken to Baltimore to be shipped south to New Orleans. In the meantime, um, Mrs. Madison sold the mother. And fortunately, the mother was able to find a buyer in Washington, so she was able to stay here uh, in the city. A lot of people began to work to raise money to buy Ellen, or Ellen Ann, as she was sometimes called. Among the people who were engaged in this endeavor was a congressman, congressman, I'm sorry, this is a long story, but I, a congressman from Massachusetts named John Gorham Palfrey, whom many of you know was an outstanding intellectual. And he himself contributed and persuaded other people to do likewise. Mrs. Madison invited him to tea and she, he turned her down. And he wrote to a friend, I could not face going to tea with Mrs. Madison after what she had done to those two slaves. But he did vote for Congress to buy Madison's papers. Well, one of um, Madison's uh, young admirers in his later years was Actually, he wasn't that young anymore, a man named Edward Coles, whom some of you may know something about. And Coles was, had convinced himself that he had persuaded Madison to do the right thing, that is, free his slaves, emancipate them in his will, which, among other things, would have left an unambiguous um, testament to his anti-slavery convictions. After Madison's death and the reading of the will, um, Coles was incredulous to discover that what he thought to be true was not. And at first he, my memory on this may be a little shaky, it's been a long time, at first he tried to convince himself that there was a secret codicil to the will somewhere. Um, and that really didn't work because it never surfaced. And after gathering testimony from people who had allegedly seen this secret codicil, it was clear that that wasn't going to work. And he finally, in trying to hold on to his own image of Madison, which I think failed to understand the full complexity of what Madison had been up against, um, found a culprit to explain what appeared to be his hero's failings. And the culprit was Dolly. He turned on her after she had passed away, what, in 1849, I think. Um, there had to be some way to explain what had gone wrong. And he suddenly found plenty of evidence, perhaps including the piece you're talking about, that Dolly had failed her husband. I'm not, I don't know enough to know if that was even remotely a reasonable general perspective for Coles to take, but um, it was Dolly who ended up taking the hit. Thank you very much. You're welcome. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.